Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to what Piano Tech that? Radio Hour. Yeah. How are you doing today? Good to see all your lovely faces. Yeah, I love to see the whole lineup. <laughs> yeah, Thank I always you. enjoy. I always enjoy seeing these folks in other nations than my own as well. We got Raymond, I see over there from South Africa. Yeah. Clement from Mauritius. Juan Shutis. Argentina. Yeah. And of course, we have Pooja streaming in from India. I'm not sure if I yeah, see any. So I don't know if people. I know the countries of some of these other people. But so many humans. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you for coming to Piano Tech Radio Hour. And Ethan, will you introduce us? Yeah. So, well, first, first off, this is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses bringing you uh, cutting-edge instruction from the best in the piano industry, uh, from their homes and workshops to yours. You can find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And uh, today, we're going to feature a guest, Adele Fondrick, who is an icon in the piano design in the industry. He's, he's uh, as I've come to know him, over the years just learned he's he takes responsibility for learning about things that need to be explored and so <laughs> seeing a, a dearth of great information about piano design he he's become one of the leading industry experts in that and so we're happy to have him and we will have an upcoming private master class with him it was going to be today but we've postponed it sorry for that it's, complicated times, of course. Um, but that will be two weeks from now, October 3rd at 4 p.m. Eastern time. We'll do it an hour after our typical radio hour ends. And on that, we're going to talk about a soundboard refurbishment using epoxy. But today we're just going to chat with Dell, um, pick his brain and ask him some questions. So, so before uh, you leave, Del. Uh, welcome, Dell. Listen, Ethan, before you go there, I just want to say that Private offline to me this week have been three or four emails saying, hey, man, do not miss Dill, Dell's masterclass. It's the greatest thing since sliced breads. It's not BS. <laughs> it absolutely works. You know, uh, go for it. You know, you need, to, you need to be there. And you need to tell a bunch of other people that this is really, this is effective. This is not BS, so get that. Yeah. yeah, and I can read an email Ooh. later I got from someone who sent me, you know, he's been doing this technique for years and says yeah. it works like a charm. So Yeah, 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 me do. too. Three or two or three or four of those, actually. Awesome. So good on you, Dell. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. So Dell, uh, I'm I'm gonna launch this off with the with the first question here. And I think I just like to get a little bit of background for everybody. Maybe some of you folks know it. Um, it was always fascinating for me to learn it when I learned it. Tell us about the transition from being a piano technician, guy out there working in the field, tuning pianos, uh, working for stores, into getting into piano design. How, how did that, was it, was it sudden? Was it the smooth transition? How did that happen? Uh, it was a mistake, actually. Um, I started out you know, when I was about 17 years old, which is, dates me as back in the very early 1960s. Um, I had a job working for a, a refinisher who also did pianos. And he, um, you know, it was kind of a temporary thing. He hired me even though I was underage. And we... Uh, showed up for work one day and he wasn't there and we're waiting around and, and it was a scene just out of the godfather 
uh, this long black limousine pulled up. This guy in this slick, shiny suit got out. Where the blankety blank blank is that blankety that low life SOB? <clears throat> I, 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 we, we don't know, sir. <laughs> well, you tell that Cleveland, if he don't show up with the money tonight, we're breaking legs. And he got back in his car and drove away. And we never saw the, the boss again. So I was out of a job in uh, San Bernardino, California. And I uh, went looking for work in the morning. It was very hot in the afternoon. So my brother was there, Daryl, uh, who also was looking for steady work. But in the meantime, he was tuning pianos for the local Baldwin dealer, Stepan Piano and Organ Company. And uh, so he had this little one-room kind of a workshop thing back in the and it was cool. It was air, the building was air conditioned, so I went there in the afternoon just to get out of the heat. And I started fussing with these pianos. And pretty soon, I'd figured out enough that I could do basic upright action refurbishing, as it was called then. Uh, I could make them play a little less bad and make them look a little bit better. And I kept doing this and started getting paid for it. And ultimately, we got ourselves a, a bigger shop. And, we bought a piano. It was a little five foot, no name, something or other. And uh, we rebuilt it, which is a whole story all by itself about how I took all the strings off and put them in the dumpster and uh, then realized that, oh, those strings were all different sizes. <laughs> and I had no idea what those sizes might be. So I went out to the dumpster and the garbage truck is coming down the road. And I'm inside, crawl inside the dumpster, and I'm hauling all these wires out so I can get them back in the shop and measure them. Uh, but we got the piano put together and miraculously sold it uh, to a nightclub up in uh, Lake Arrowhead. And even more miraculously, about six months later, Daryl comes down. He'd been up there tuning pianos. And he's got this big smile on his face, and he says, you know the piano we sold to what's the, the club up there? Yeah. What, what's wrong with it? Well, the place burned down last night and took everything with it. <laughs> so that was probably oh. the best, best thing that could have ever happened to that piano. But, <laughs> um, you know, just over the years, I just got more and more involved in piano rebuilding. Um, didn't learn to tune at that point. Uh, was drafted into the Army. Um, very quickly ran out and joined the Air Force. And uh, four years later, I uh, got back out and I was foot loose and fancy free and didn't have any work to do. So uh, I went up to Mendocino. Uh, Daryl had some had a, a little short time thing of reconditioning a bunch of pianos at the uh, Humboldt State College. So I helped him with that. And mm -hmm. Eventually ended up in Portland working with him um, and always as a rebuilder. So the 72 National Convention came along. Uh, I was scheduled to teach a class in Grand Piano, Grand, Grand Piano Hammer Installation. <clears throat> and uh, three or four months before the convention, somebody finally figured out that I was not a PTG member. Oh, well, why not? Well, I don't tune. At the time, the piano hospital was going strong. And they waived the requirement for my not, they, they let me in even though I wasn't legally blind. Right. And basically locked me in the back room and said, you can come out when you can tune a piano. Wow. Uh, so three months later, I passed my uh, exam as a full-fledged piano tuner, taught the class, got married, and uh, haven't looked back since. But I... Uh, it's always mostly as a rebuilder. And then I went to work. Um, there were some changes made in the, uh, the Steinway dealership in Portland in the early 70s. And I ended up working for the new Steinway dealer with the condition that I would, um, I would service and prep all of the new Steinway pianos coming in. Well, That's this neat. was kind of a revelation to me because I got to work on the same model piano Repeatedly. And what year was this? I think I joined that in about 74, 75. Ooh. 
something like some, that. Some some fairly rocky Steinway. Steinway. Oh, uh, they were horrible. Yeah, uh, we no we kidding. literally rebuilt some of these things. I, oh, trust me, I was working in yeah. a warehouse of Steinways from eighty one to eighty six, and they were getting better by then. Well, nominally <laughs> better. They, but we were we we replaced pen blocks and new pianos, uh, replaced wow. hammers. So did we. Relocated yeah. action stacks, re re moved uh, capstans around, restrung many new. Oh, wow, you did? You moved capstans around? Oh yeah. In the seventies, dude. Yeah, to get rid of nine lead weights in a Model S or Model no, M. No, no. You were you were deep. You were like, there was only one guy in L.A. that was even anywhere near there. Yeah, we. It was. The, what do you do when you you go to a customer who? Uh, well, you, she's you, a widow. Uh, yeah. She's a widow, and on his dying bed, they he had wanted to buy her a Steinway Grand all all their lives. He had a lot of health insurance. And he made her promise that when she collected the health insurance, that um, she would buy a Steinway Grand. So she did. And when I got involved, she couldn't play the piano. It hurt, it hurt her fingers. And um, so I went to see her and she was practically in tears. I mean, and and so I thought, you know, I, I measured down weight and it was 52, 50, 48, it looked great. So what's the complaint? So I started to tune the piano. And by the time I got up into the, the uh, set of temperament, and then by the time I got about halfway through, my fingers were sore. And I had to struggle to finish tuning this piano. Wow. Um, and so there's something wrong here. So I pulled the action, lifted some keys up. And, and in the low bass, I was counting nine leads oh my in, the, in the weight. And the sharps, on the lowest three sharps, there was a lead stuck in the front of the key, in front of the, the key bushing. It was a small one, but it was there. Serious? Wow. So I called the factory and I talked to somebody. I don't, I don't remember who. Um, and they asked about downweight. I, I explained the downweight was fine. Well, it's meet factory specs. So there's nothing we can do about it. So that was my... That was my introduction into action geometry. At that time, nobody was doing anything that I could find. Now, kids, you got to understand, these are apocalyptic stories. These are like <laughs> beginning stories. It was like a dark frontier, right? Uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> like was, like saying, saying you were going to work on the geometry of a yeah, piano. Yeah, that was, that was horrible. Are you serious? Are you you? What do you think you are a factory? Mm -hmm. Well, I relocated the capstans and Jeez. I made a little device so I could slide it back. Terrorist, you were, Jesus. But I, and and I, I had no idea what I was doing. I just figured it out as I went. Um, by the time I got through with the piano, I had uh, I had four leads in the lowest key. Wow! And diminished from that. And I actually put a few on the backside or yeah, the backside up in the treble to, to bring it back up. Yeah. Um, delivered the action, went through another quick tuning just to touch it up and let the lady sit down to play. And she played for about maybe two minutes and she just sat there and wept. She was so ecstatic that she could finally play her piano. And how can you ever get paid for that? You can't. Mm. <laughs> well, you Steinway can't certainly didn't pay us. No, you can't. You can't get paid for that. You just you have to, <clears throat> have to pay your heart. But it was at that. Yeah, it was through that transition when I was working on a lot of pianos, regarded well regarded pianos, and I kept finding the same acoustical problems in the same models time after time after time after time. Yeah. 
And at first I logged it out to my ineptness. I just wasn't skilled enough. I didn't have enough experience. And then I'd go to a convention uh, and I'd listen to other people who I respected greatly. And I found they were having the same problems. Yeah. And they had tried all the things that I tried. And they didn't have any other suggestions. Um, and Steinway's approach was, well, you're just incompetent. And uh, which may, may or may not have been true. I, you know, I'm not, I don't know. But uh, the center, finally, I, I finally, I decided that no, not, these are not, they're not even quality control problems. These are fundamental design issues. So I thought, well, I'd like to learn something about design. So I canvassed the existing piano manufacturers and I found out that no one was doing any piano design with the exception of Baldwin. No one. Baldwin was doing it. You mean no one in the, no American maker? No doing. American manufacturers were doing piano design. Wow. Uh, in one case, I called uh, I called Aeolian for a problem, and I thought, well, as long as I've got you on the phone. Uh, so I asked for a, to speak to somebody in their uh, design department. Uh, well, sir, well, we, we don't actually, we don't have a design department. Oh, okay. How about, uh, can I speak to a head of your, uh, uh, head of engineering? Well, sir, uh, we don't really have an engineering department. Oh, okay. How about your head technician? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, we do have somebody working on players. Now, this was Aeolian, which at the time was the largest piano manufacturer in the world. Um, so I just, gradually... a quick, just a quick interjection there, just, yeah. just to get, and maybe you don't have the answer to it. At some point, they had to have an original design for the piano. Do you know where those things came from? Were they just kind of what was it sure. just kind of pieced together copy of something else or yeah uh, sure yeah. that came from the 1920s 1910s yeah, 1930s, mm. 1930s um, weeded out a lot of them and yeah the machines kind of got picked up and the but the design stagnated um and, and indeed the if you if you go to a nam show and you look at the different offerings there now, um, you see the same thing. I mean, you see a lot of homogeneity. The, the, the designs are so similar. They've got the same issues, the same problems. Some companies have learned to cope with the design issues a little better than others have, but um, I mean, we still have the same reverse hook bridges. We still have too many too many notes in the, uh, or too few notes in the bass sections. We still have gnarly bass tenor crossovers. We still have, you know, a, a lot of the same acoustical problems that we've always had, we still have. Um, so we haven't progressed a great deal. Um, anyway, I, Barb got a job in there in, um, in Central California. We moved to Sacramento and I was able to take a year to just fuss around. And I would take, pick up an old free upright and pull a soundboard out and do weird and strange things to it. I did super thin soundboards. I did thick soundboards. I did lots of ribs. I did little, few ribs. I did, uh, I ruined a lot of pianos. Uh, some of which I still have the, the posts holding up my workbenches and things of that sort. But, but I did learn some of the, at least what seemed to me to be principles of piano design. And I also studied the pianos that I rebuilt. Uh, I would stop and as I took pianos apart, I'd look at them and why the hell did he do that? And I'd study, so I've learned a lot from people like Matthew and Chickering and Kanabi and uh, <clears throat> you know, all these, all these old, <laughs> Uh, all these old designers that we dismiss with such contempt were, were really quite brilliant. And um, the more you study their work and the more you look at them and think about, oh, that's interesting, but no, think about why, what was going through his head when he, when he conceived this, 
you know, what was Malin trying to do when he did? What was what was Julius what was Julius Bauer that, trying to do? Yeah. And so it's bizarre that all these quote off brand makers whose now pianos have basically no commercial value whatsoever um, are being recognized for wow these guys were these guys were were trying to shake some stuff up. Is well, I don't know I'm if they're doing? if they're recognized by the mainstream yet. They certainly are by me. I will stop and study these these what we what we think of as as oddball pianos um, and just you, you just kind of try to teleport yourself back and you, you try to figure out okay this piano was done in 1910 what kinds of factory equipment did this factory use they didn't have cnc machinery so how how would why, and then why put yourself in the mind of the of the designer of this thing, and he he did look I, like right next door, right next to me here, I have uh, an 1888 uh, Kanabi Grand, and uh, it's one I resurrected. I got it in in Memphis. the uh, The owner gave it to me rather than sell it because she thought that I would actually do something useful with it rather than just patch it up and sell it as junk. So I have, I've rebuilt it uh, a few years ago for the sole reason of it's a tri-level scale. And I've tuned a couple of pianos with a tri-level scale, but I had never actually worked on one. So I wanted to, I wanted to actually work on one. And um, can you just clarify, cause I'm not sure. Maybe some other people have a question. What, what would a tri-level scale be? Okay, yeah. the, we're familiar with overstrung scales. The, the tenor scales are on one plane, and then the bass scale comes over the top of that. This has, I think it's a five or six unisons in the tenor that go between the normal tenor strings and the overstrung bass strings. And wow. the, this, it has a... Mean actually unisons go between them? Yeah, there's one, two, three. I wonder if I can. I don't know if I can do this or not. Let me see. Nah. <laughs> this this may I or may not. Up, I wouldn't mess up your rig, dude. Oh, no, it's all right. Here he goes. Here he goes. Here he goes, everyone. You just might lose him. <laughs> Here he goes. I played this. I played this piano, by the way. Can, it, it there sounds maybe it's really good. Can you see that at all? Let me spot let me spotlight you just a second here. Let's make you big. Okay. So I can see yeah. Right there. Okay. There's five unisons of tricord wrapped strings that go wow. over the tenor strings and go under the bass strings. Wow. Huh. And there's a just five. Uh, there's a third bridge that is just behind the tenor bridge and just a little bit taller than the tenor bridge uh -huh. and it's kind of fastened to it uh and you but know not it's a, the way third bridge right not right that a not the same yeah it's not the same thing um so anyway i if 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 i was brave enough i'd try to show you a, a better uh, more more clear picture of it but I wanted to know firsthand what it was like. Did I get that centered okay again? Yeah, yep, you're fine. good. Perfect. Okay. Um, I now understand why they did it. And I also understand why so, they no longer do it. And, uh, and, and quickly, what, why did they no why did they, why did they do it? And why do they no longer do it? Well, the hammers on this piano are Ronson hammers with uh, bacon felt. Yeah. So far, they've not been touched with a needle. And it has one of the smoothest bass to tenor transitions that I've encountered in a long time. Hmm. The transition is the big deal there. It, it's, it's, 
it's almost completely musically transparent. Um, and like I say, I have not, I have not done a bit of voicing on those hammers, nothing. So uh, that's the upside. The downside is that, that that third bridge that's stuck on the back of the tenor bridge is a horrible thing to work on. We re it was it was just crumbling. It was coming apart. So we had to make basically a new one. And uh, getting all the little pieces aligned in there was was not easy. So it's something that you can do in your workshop, but in production, it would be very, very difficult to do. Okay. So I, I can understand why they would stop doing it. The, the, and I think uh, one or two years later, they had gone to a more normal transition bridge on this model. So we aren't going to count on the question of fidelity of phones and little no. tiny computer speakers. So, but do you hear a difference in the transition? You do, obviously. And it's beyond the, the hammer set. It's, it's, it's also the... Yeah, well, I don't, I'm, not really a, I'm not really a pianist. So I listen to it as I tune it and as I fuss around and, and, and uh, yeah. would normally do, do voicing. But uh, well, as I tune the piano, yes, there are differences, but it's what I call musically transparent. Yeah. That uh, pianists, we have uh, our friend Wolfgang, who's a, a regional concert pianist, comes over and plays his piano well he used to before COVID came along and he would just stop by and play the piano just because he loves it so much um, and he'll bring his music and he'll sit here and rehearse for a few hours <clears throat> um, others come by and just just to play it because they like the the sound of it it has other features it has this it has the thinnest soundboard that I have encountered in a, in a factory built piano. The board at the center is, is six millimeters thick. Wow. Steinway by, by contrast would be nine. Wow. Um, I got a comment here uh, from Facebook. Yeah, actually. yeah, please. Any more comments or questions for you, please? What, it's actually just uh, very direct to the situation. Joshua Jones commented on Facebook. He said he played this Kanabi last fall and it's very nice. And yeah, I think I mentioned earlier that I, I have played this as well. It's a nice sounding piano. I don't remember specifically about the transition. I don't think it was, I was uh, like paying specific attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also noticed like with that one, you, you, you did the epoxy treatment on that piano? As yes. Well? Yeah, yes. and with these pianos, very interesting. I'll ask you, hey, when's the last time you tuned this? You know, and you'll, be, you'll tell me, it's been quite a while and they usually sound really good. <laughs> it's quite surprising. If, so, if, it, if you, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Um, what determined, would you say it's a, it's a, it's a warm sound or a bright sound or probably warmer rather than brighter? Well, I got, I chose Ronson hammers with bacon felt because it's about the softest felt we can get right now. Um, and I asked him to press them on the light side. And uh, so it's, it's a warmer sound. Uh, which in a piano like this is something I try to do because I, <laughs> I believe it's closer to what the original makers had in mind than what we typically encounter today. Um, we can, you know, Dell, if, do you think it's feasible to hop over there and just play through it? It might not do it just it, but, but some people are very interested in just yeah, I'm hearing very, through the, absolutely. hearing through the break, you know, just play through those, you know, a few notes before those five and, if, and then through it a few after and just hear. I'll do it. I don't know how this is going to come off in the, so that's what I mean. Okay. My, my computer ears, microphone. My ears are Can you go fun. over there? Can you go over there with the, yeah, he's, <laughs> see here. He's also in the distance. His microphone is on the.
that actually even through yeah. you know uh little teeny microphone stuff sounds pretty good so, yeah and I, and I see what i see what he's saying i don't think you can hear us right now but i think i i think we can tell what at least what you're saying is that the tonal consistency it doesn't really change that much you don't hear like a sudden shift between wound strings and and plain wire strings that's the idea well yeah that's awesome um the the transition comes from g sharp the 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 three uh, transition string or five transition strings are from g sharp to c um, Del, can you talk about what's going on in the Chinese channel market now, in terms of <laughs> in, in terms of what's coming to the United States and what's actually? Before we shift to that, before we shift to that, that's a great question. I just want to make sure we follow it up. So you said Sorry. why why you why they did that to that piano, and then you said why they don't do it anymore. It, was it specifically just about the bridge and how to handle the bridge yeah. to cover that? Or? Well, it's a pain in the neck to, to build it. Uh, okay. Some of that might be made easier today with more precise computer controlled drilling, but um, fabricating that, that uh, and we did, we did end up making a new bridge, even though we had the original to go by, it was still um it it took longer to do than just a normal bridge work because you have little posts that have to fit very carefully between the unisons of the strings just below and then you have to build that up to just the right height because of course you have down bearing to worry about here too uh then that the the top would the bridge cap is rather thin, so how do you make the original had split quite badly? So how do we put that back together without it splitting? Okay, so we used a, a laminated uh, bridge cap. Well, then that makes it difficult to, to, to notch. Um, there were just a lot of steps involved that slowed us down. Admittedly, if you were doing this, this in production, and I am always amazed when I see production workers, a good one, uh, at how fast and efficiently they work. But even so, it, it, was a, it was a complicated process. And I think in the end, you can do as well with competent string layout and just using a transition bridge, a, a standard it. transition bridge. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for going into some details there. David, great question. Can you just uh, rephrase what yeah. you said? Um, right before the show, I was saying that I deeply respect your kind of current knowledge of what's going on in the Chinese piano industry and the community. And so I, I, I wanted to know, I wanted to know, um, what are the current kind of state of the art um, Chinese pianos that you can buy in this country for a reasonable price that will actually serve you as a decent instrument? Well, I don't know that I can get to brands because I'm not that familiar with them currently. Um, the Chinese, the, the better Chinese manufacturers, have been learning to control wood moisture content. That for generations was a particular problem. Um, I've been in, in factories where they assured me that, oh yes, absolutely, they, they, uh, they have good conditioning rooms, so let's go see them. And you'll see something that looks like a series of garages with the doors all open and um, wood is stacked inside and well, how are you controlling the moisture in these? Um, and they'll come up with something or other, but then they open the, they open the doors at five o'clock in the morning 
and the weather is 92 degrees and 90% humidity and the doors stay open all day. Um, didn't matter what it started out in the morning. <laughs> you know, this is not this is not competent wood moisture control, and that that's in actually one of the better factories. Um, other factories have what they call conditioning rooms with no no control set up whatsoever. Uh, they think that that's good enough. You have room. This here we keep our wood here. Uh, okay, but. What do you do to control moisture content? Uh, well, we, we keep the wood in the room. Um, so the better factories are figuring that out. I mean, Japan went that route back in the, in the 60s. We got Japanese pianos um, with soundboards falling out and cracking and doing all kinds of weird things. And then we went through it again with uh, with the Koreans, the Horrigals. Um, and, you know, they finally figured it out. <clears throat> um, and, you know, the, the Chinese are finally figuring that out too. The Chinese excel at uh, automation and, in, in they're again, in their better factories. Um, they're doing things with CNC uh, machinery that uh, was never done in the U S um, you can see a, 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 a skeleton, put a grand skeleton put together uh, with the, the, the belly bracing put into just spectacularly beautiful dovetail joints. Well, it took the machine five minutes to do that. Right. Uh, that's not going to happen in, a, in, a, in another factory. Whether that makes this a better piano or not can be debated. But uh, that kind of thing is stuff they do very, very well. Um, when you say though that generally build quality raises the bar, they're generally... getting they're getting better at that. Um, and you know, people who who sell these pianos would be in a better position to to comment than I am because I don't sell them. The only time I get involved in anything is when there's a problem, and that's that biases things. Yeah, uh, you so, know, you you could. You yeah. can sell a hundred great pianos and then one of them has a problem and I get involved and there's this and that. And so it's not fair for me to say, oh yeah, well the whole, they're all bad because I found this one bad piano. Um, yeah. See, I, 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 pre I prepare good high end pianos for a dealer here. And every once in a while they all have me prepare a high end Chinese piano. Mm -hmm. And over the past, let's say, two or three years, I have been surprised by what are called high-end Chinese pianos, that they're pretty darn good. Yeah, they've been steadily improving. Um, what I see lacking in all of the Asian pianos, and I include... Um, I include pianos from Japan, Korea, Indonesia, and China, is very little in the way of innovative thinking in terms of design. Mm. Even pianos that uh, are introduced as brand new state-of-the-art designs, I look at them, well, it's certainly refined and, and it's a beautiful piano, but I don't understand where the state-of-the-art part comes in. Um, Give us an example of what you're thinking about when you think about that. Well, look at look at uh, look at Kawaii's uh, Shiguru pianos, mm -hmm. fantastically built pianos. I mean, I don't know how I don't know how carefully you would have to look at one of those pianos to find a, a, a con, an assembly flaw or a materials flaw. They're, they're impeccable, right. but is, are they that much better than the concert grand of 50 years ago? They look, they look the same, the same scale. They are. Well, that, that's because that's ideal. I, I don't think so. Um, you look at the smaller pianos, you know, the bridge layouts are the same. The, you said they take the same tension drops at the low tenor. 
uh, you, you just kind of go on and on. Um, I see the same kinds of material, woods used in soundboards. Why are we put, still putting uh, wood soundboards in pianos? I mean, to me, that's incomprehensible. Uh, the world is running out of woods. Look at the, look at the fires we've had. Uh, well, I hate to tell you this, but there, there are fires in Alaska. There's fires in, in uh, 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 northern Russia. Siberia. 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 Uh, what the illegal loggers haven't taken out, the fires are getting. You know, so we have very limited resources, of what we call musical grade resources left. But we're going to keep plugging away. Okay, well, laminated sandboards, finally, uh, and I don't know if I'm to blame or if I can take some tiny little bit of credit for it, for it uh, more and more companies are building <laughs> fairly good pianos with laminated yeah. soundboards. Yeah. And I'm delighted to see that. Uh, it should have been done 40 years ago. Well, uh, it was done. <laughs> I'm not sure it was done very well, um, but we've moved beyond the Kimball laminated box crate pianos. And oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it was sort of the, the problem is, as you've explained before, and we might've talked about this before on, on a previous episode, but um, just to refresh, it, it, your, your philosophy on that is that, well, they introduced laminated soundboards in the lower quality pianos. And so everything was lower quality, including the yes. laminated soundboard. And uh, so no then the la laminated soundboard got a bad rap. If they would have introduced it in the higher quality pianos, they would have put more time and effort into doing that. And it might have been great. Yeah, you look at, look at the soundboards that, that Hyundai has been using. Uh, Hyundai, uh, excuse me. Um, Hailun. Hailun has been using. They're good boards. And yes, they're laminated, um, but they're good soundboards. They have crown and bearing. Yeah, and they're more stable, they're and they they don't crack, and you know there's they have a lot of advantages to them. But well, that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's only a stopgap. Um, we should be using a lot more a lot more composites in pianos than we're using. Uh, I've written an article on, <laughs> yeah, several actually. Uh, the idea is where do we go from here? Um, pianos are heavier than they need to be. They're, they're bulkier than they need to be. Um, so I, I, I don't see much in the way of innovative, creative design coming out of any of these companies. Uh, there's a few guys in Europe that are doing some outstanding work. Um, you can buy a flat strung piano now uh, patterned after the, the Berenborn piano. Um, uh, Palello in France has built a, a, a couple of flat strung pianos. Why don't we see more of this? The, the flat strung layout has lots to offer. We don't use it now because uh, back in the 1870s, Steinle came along with this big, powerful, overstrung instrument. And because of their incredible manufacturing capabilities and marketing capabilities. They just kind of buried everybody else. But uh, if you spend any time rebuilding a uh, chickering flat strung uh, concert grand of that time, which I have uh, with a modern scale and uh, a decent action and hammers, <laughs> That is a fantastic instrument by anybody's standards. And it solves some problems. It's not exactly the same as the Steinway, but it, it's, it's a, a gorgeous instrument in its own right. So yeah, we've homogenized the piano to a great extent. And when I look at Chinese pianos, um, I see just more of that, more homogenization. And I'd like to see that change. Um, yeah, it seems to me like what what you're what you're characterizing as as innovative. I think you would you would know it when you see it because it would almost also be disruptive to the industry. Like you see these things happening in other industries, they disrupt the industry because it's new. You know, it makes people think differently. Maybe even changes how people do things, materials, whatnot. You know, 
example might be Uber, you know, for tax. Uber disrupts the taxi industry, right? So is, is, like is there saying, there's anything, not much going on with pianos like that. That's right. And that's what I'm saying. So what could disrupt the piano industry? What could possibly? Well, um, I don't think anything not, is going to revolutionize it. But for example, um, and this goes back to a hobby horse of mine that I've been promoting on and off for many years. Um, your client has a condominium in downtown Seattle. Uh, it only cost them about $18 million. So, you know, these people are obviously not cash poor. But you go into the condominium and they've got maybe a thousand square feet, which is not very big. Um, our house here is, I don't know, maybe 20, 20, 2400, something like that. Um, so I have room for this piano. This, this thing's big. It's wide, it's bulky, it's, you know, it's, it's fat. Um, so your client says, I'd like a better piano for my condominium. Well, what do you, what do you have? Well, I want something good. Uh, so what are my choices? Well, your, ch your choices are, well, of course, Steinway makes the, the Model S. Is there anyone here who's ever recommended the Model S to anybody? Um, and why not? Because it's a terrible piano. So certainly not one made in the last 50 years. What, what, um, what are their, what are their options? Well, y y you can't go shopping for a small piano, grand piano in America. You go shopping for a short grand piano. So what if we revisioned that? What if we said, okay, what's the problem here? Well, problem is excessive width and bulk and weight. So instead of making that piano uh, 59 or 60, 60 inches wide, let's make it 54 inches wide. Instead of making the, the rim 11 or 12 inches deep, let's make it maximum 10. Um, I have a design in, in my computer here uh, of a uh, five foot five grand that takes up less floor space than the Young Chang Samek ubiquitous uh, four foot 11. It's an immensely better, well, I haven't built it, so I, I say it has the potential for being a much, much better performing piano, and it actually takes up less space. So would that be a, a, a would that be a big change to the industry? I don't know. Neither does anybody else. Let me go through some of the comments here. That's, that's uh, great to hear. Um, well, first of all, I'll jump back to one I saw previously. Let me get here. Um, <clears throat> Eric Johnson, I think Yamaha Avant Grand is rather disruptive. Carbon fiber soundboards from Steingraber. Um, some things that he mentioned. David Boyce said, Lindner, the Ripon subsidiary set up in, love them. in the early 1960s. Oh, I love them. <laughs> making lightweight, upright pianos and sounded good and were stable, but the materials available then let them down, particularly some plastics. But yeah, we've got a lot of different plastics nowadays. Uh, Mark Campbell, have there been any developments to the scaling of smaller grants, especially in the back scale? Releasing Ooh, the soundboard, et cetera? There has been some. Um, uh, there's been a, a reluctance to deal with the back scale because we're still convinced that we've got to have the, that the low bass strings have to be as long as possible. But there's been some steps forward in that regard. I've removed the, I've removed the the uh, base bridge cantilevers on a number of short pianos, and I don't know that it started to trend yet, but I think people are starting to look about it. Look at it. 
Let me uh, continue here. Kevin Clem uh, said, and the avant grand won't last with years and years of playing. Um, Eric Johnson disagreed. Uh, wait, yeah, Kevin Clem, you know how. Uh, pianos don't necessarily last years and years. Um, without substantial work, hammers, bushings, restringing. Um, Kevin Clem said, one of the venues in Ohio has one. It's avant grand. It's five years old. It doesn't feel anywhere near the same to play. I believe it won't last as long as an old piano. Might need more maintenance. And I want to jump back to this comment. Um, well, and it, maintenance is another yeah. issue. Right. Um, you know, we bought a TV set in here. Now, when I first started, when, I, when, when we bought our first color television set, we had to fuss with it a lot. It needed alignment. It needed fussing with it. needed all color corrections and all this stuff. Well, we put up with it because we had to. And now I mean, I've got that thing that hangs on the wall up there. Um, I bought it, took it out of the box, hung it up, plugged it in. It works. It works. It works. It works. It works. Eventually I'll, I'll have to replace it, but it's not going to need any maintenance at all. All right. I buy a piano and I'm warned right up front that, oh yeah, it needs to be tuned three, four times a year. Uh, it needs constant maintenance. I mean, why? If we, you know, I said, I made my comment about uh, why aren't we using composites and soundboards? Why aren't we using composites and actions? Much more stable much more, um, much less prone to needing periodic servicing. The, you know, the regulation in a Wessel Nickel Gross action, uh, once it's in there, it's good. I would assume the same thing is true with Kawhi's action. I haven't worked on a lot of Kawhi, Kawhi pianos, but that's a great action. And why in the world other companies are not emulating that is just flat beyond me. I, I, it makes no sense. Mm. The, we got a comment from Facebook here. Or actually, let me jump back to the one I wanted to. Yoshi uh, put an interesting link to an article uh, several minutes ago. There's a Yangtze River piano has been selected to be one of the appointed pianos used for the, uh, what is that, 16th International Tchaikovsky Competition. And I'm oh. not aware, I don't have any familiarity with Yangtze, so Yangtze River. Um, Kevin Clem, that was his last comment there. Oh, and I have a comment from Facebook and we're, we're sh getting out of time here, but um, Joshua Jones said, do you have the same thoughts on Yamaha's borrowing conservatory grants? Any innovati innovating going on there? Oh wait, sorry. There's more to the comment. Do you have any thought? Do you have the same thoughts on Yamaha's borrowing Bosendorfer design in their new conservatory grants? Any innovating going on there? I'm not familiar enough with them to, to make a. Are you familiar with the new V series Bosendorf? No, I'm I'm not familiar enough with them to comment. Okay. Sorry. They're fairly startling pianos. I'll jump in here because we're we're getting short on time. We're not we're not out yet, but um, just to observe that there's a lot to talk about. And Dell has, as you can tell, just so much interesting information um, that is, in some ways, it's research generated. In some ways, it's just uh, um, inquiry, right? You know, just having the curiosity to experiment and explore. Um, so even though we're running out of time, we appreciate you being, being here and taking the time and definitely encourage people to join uh, the Epoxy on Soundboards Masterclass. It's going to be on October 3rd at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And um, just also mention, I can mention briefly, we can try this again uh, today. We tried it last week. Where's my dog? I don't, oh, yeah, we have to get Java come in and... Uh, give a guest appearance as well. Java usually jumps in on the master class sessions as well. You'll, you'll have to get him. To, uh... yeah. Come here. Come here, big puppy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Barbara, by the way. You mentioned her earlier. That's Dell's wife. She's Barbara? also 
quite integral <laughs> to, to Dell's productivity. Come here. Here you go. Her. Here you go. You've got to get him to the other side. Yeah. Good boy. <laughs> Come here. He's a big dog. Here. It's here. not going to just jump up on your lap. There he is. Hi, Hi Java. Hey, Java. Hey, Java. Hey, He's hey. a big baby. Java. Java. You want that? Yeah. <laughs> no, no treats. No treats. I'm cool right now. I'm having my moment. He's having his, his 15 minutes of fame right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, I, uh, uh, he's 10 years old now, and he's slowly going blind. Uh, uh, but, but he's basically a sniffer. So uh, he does pretty well all on his own just by sniffing stuff out. So he's still grooving. He's still oh, yeah. Grooving. It, it, it hasn't slowed him down much. Uh, I see. He's so, Dell, again, thank you so much yep. for giving us this hour and being a fascinating human being yeah. in a little nerdy world. I love it. Just love it. Um, signing off. Ethan, why don't you take well, us got, home? Yeah, we got a few minutes left to all. Take a minute to Do thank we? everybody that's helping behind the scenes. Yeah, Good. and it's just enough time that I want to share this uh, via screen share that I didn't get to share last week. Um, this is what I've been mentioning about where you can meet uh, other piano technicians and have a chat and you're all mm -hmm. invited. I just put the link in the, in the uh, zoom chat there to come check it out. But you're basically, you're given this little man you can walk around as or woman, uh, although it's pretty gender neutral, you can not do much, but sit down and, hang out but the cool thing you can do is uh, when there's other individuals walking around when you get close to them you can have a, a private conversation with the people that you're close to um, so it's, it's interesting it's very new technology and uh, I encourage you all to just jump on there today for a few minutes and see if there's anybody you want to chat with it might be kind of fun um, I'm testing this out if it's useful for us so uh, I'm, I may I may not uh, I may not have access to this beyond the end of the month. So if you want to jump on and give it a shot and tell me what you think, uh, but it might be a nice place to have a little after party and, and talk to whoever you like, when, however you like in this, in this virtual space. So go ahead and, and check that out. And beyond that, in the, um, in the chat previously, Pooja put some links for you. There's a link for the feedback form. Um, there's a link to join uh, Del Fondrick's masterclass you can either pay a, pay a one-off fee um, and then you'll have live access and the recording for, you know, in perpetuity to review, or you can subscribe for 79 a month for Craftsman subscription. You'll be able to access that live and the recording along with our entire library of recordings. It's a pretty good deal. It's probably your best uh, deal right there. And next week, I'm really excited. We're having a follow-up. Mm. Eric very Johnson came on previously, brought up this very interesting topic of uh, regulating and thinking about voicing for the shift pedal and the very nuanced, nuanced ways that you can think about the shift <laughs> pedal in various positions. And we're going to have a piano player who is very, uh, very well versed in techniques that you know he uses with the shift pedal. And his name is uh, Frederick Chu. Uh, we put a K on his name there in the chats, misspelled. Excellent pianist. Um, I've been reviewing his recordings. I mean, he's incredible. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real privilege to have him join us next week along with Eric to have some discussion about, you know, special usage of, of the shift pedal and the voicing that goes along with that. Well, just in the perception of an artist of touch, it's always fascinating to ask an artist, just unalloyed, what what's what's your scene with touch tell me how you like a piano to sound to feel and 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 try to try to have them say it in their own words so we can get some kind of an insight it's beautiful yeah and and uh you know i met with frederick a few days ago and he's just just such a kind gentleman very you know of course very talented but very humble he has a little presentation that he often gives he's going to give us a few uh, slides from that on his on his concept of using that shift pedal and wow. eric is gonna 
graciously uh, participate in that conversation as well. And they're, they're kind of old friends, so it should be a, a very informative conversation. It's very, so, it's very embarrassing to tune and, and voice a piano for a recording and have them sit down. And the first thing that the pianist does is uses a shift pedal and the piano sounds absolutely horrible because well, you didn't uh, do that one time only. <laughs> <laughs> After that, I I learned. <laughs> you always yeah. fail. Brother. Always fail upward. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Dell, for joining us today. Um, we will see you again in two weeks. And okay. I know you got a lot of work over there. Stay healthy and good luck on your. I think you're having a design project you're working on right now, which is exciting. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in a couple of weeks and everybody else. Okay. Thank you all see you, Dale. Time. Thanks so much, man. All right. Good to see yeah. you again. All yeah. right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.